Brad Coates. That's the that's the word of the day. Brad Coates. Coates, Fry, Anamoto, and, and Gibson. Gibson. Did I get there that right? You got it. You it's got a law it. firm right here in Pioneer Plaza. Believe and Brad likes to come around and say hi. Say hi. Say hi. <laughs> say hi, Jay. And it's a it's a family law firm, so he talks about family law and things that extend from that. Um, and he's very wise because he has the ability to sort of integrate all his experiences in in, in the courtroom, in the office, you know, in life. And uh, that's why he can speak about sophisticated subjects around family law and about family. That's why we like to have him come down here. And I like being here. Yeah. So today, this is really an interesting one. We've touched on some of this before. How six somewhat shocking social megatrends are impeaching. Impacting. Impacting. Well, they may maybe impeach impeaching too. too. <laughs> I got impeachment on my... Um, modern romantic relationships. We're going to put that to music later. Okay. Okay. But what do you mean by that? Well, it's exactly what I say. The, uh, the, the change in American society is really, really dramatic. There's a lot of stuff going on um, that has changed the way relationships used to, used to was. And, uh, and then it's going to change the generations going forward. And it's going to change the face of America. I got another one, if you'll let me on later, about how the, what the ripple effect of this is going to all be for America's families overall. We're going to make a date for that right after the sure, show. Sure. Yeah. So are these all good things, Brad? I mean, is, are these all things we should be happy about that will make us feel good? Or are they all bad things? Or is it a mix? Well, it's, I mean, people are doing it because they think it makes them feel good. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, yeah, the, the individuals think it's great, a lot of it. Uh, the, whether it's good long term, that becomes a trickier question to answer, mm -hmm. because then, the, like I say, the ripple effects for society. I mean, we were talking earlier. You know, it's not, it's not like smoking, where you have a Surgeon's General report that says, "Hey, you know, smoking is going to cause cancer." We don't know what all these different changes are going to do as they percolate through society, but they're going to they're going to be big. Yeah, and and they we have so many changes. You know, it's like remember when I got out of law school. You know, and my my firm had a little meeting, and they said there's a case came down. I said, wait a minute. That case changes everything I learned in law school. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm stressed by this. I mean, I get the feeling that everything around me is changing. Nothing I know is for sure. And that's what you have here. All these changes, very stressful, huh? You know what's amazing? I've written the Divorce with Decency book. This is the fifth edition now. People keep asking me, you know, why did you write that thing five different times? It's not actually the law that has changed all that much. It's society and the effect of all this that's, that's changing. I and mean, there have been changes in the law. We didn't, when I first started practicing, we didn't have, you know, homosexual marriages or homosexual divorces. I mean, that's new news. Mm -hmm. But a lot of this other stuff is really the way society is evolving. The, the, the six, uh, the six uh, shocking megatrends. Uh, yeah, let's start, start yeah. on that. I'm ready to be shocked. Shock value. Yeah. Uh, Shock and awe. Social media and its impact on traditional approaches to romance. Sex. Entirely different approach to sex is going on. A lot of it has to do with social be a media. Show. Again. A lot of viewers. More sex. One, yeah. More sex. Pornography is a big aspect of that. Yeah, you know, that that's too. changed totally. Uh, living arrangements, cohabitation now being almost preferable to, actually is preferable in many cases, to, uh, to traditional marriage. I remember how shocking it was when that first came up when we were young. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, that's resulted in less marriage overall. The decline in the institution of marriage is happening right before our eyes. And then, but people haven't stopped having sex. Well, they've slowed it down a lot, which is surprising. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, they, they've had, they're still having enough sex to, to, to bring babies into the world. So, so the divorce calendar has shifted to a large extent from, from being a, divo a divo child custody and stuff as an outgrowth of divorce to now being what's called the paternity calendar, where, they're, you know, it can be the, relation, the outgrowth of a, Temporary relationship, anything from a one-night stand to a, to a cohabitation, but short of marriage. And then you have DNA. Then you've still, got, you've still got kids, you've still got custody, all that's still got to be handled. So that's the paternity calendar. And the other one is the one that, you know, is for yeah, years in my age group, uh, grade divorces. Uh, you know, aging boomers are getting divorced at twice the rate of anybody else right is now. Right? Which, is, which is surprising, especially when you used to think long-term marriages, you know, bode well for stability in society. And, and now... The boomers are getting divorced faster than anybody. You're going to have to explain you know, that Boomers have always, what you, what you said is exactly right. You know, is it, is it something that people want? Yeah, it seems to be. I mean, people just want everything, and they always have with our generation. Something about a longer lifespan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we like it, but is it good? Who knows? Well, let's go through it and see if it's good or bad or in the middle. Well, let's do. Uh, social media, 
Huge impact. And when you think about it, and we've talked about this on the show before, you know, it used to be you had to meet somebody live and in person to get to, to, to even form a relationship. Now you can meet unlimited number of people, you know, and the timing used to have to be right. I mean, you know, I could meet Miss Wright, but if she was married to somebody else, then, you know, it didn't work. Now the timing is almost immediate. You just pull something up on, your, on, on, the, on the net and, you know, with Tinder and all these crazy sites, you know, everything from Match.com to Tinder to the racier sites. Um, and you can have, you know, as many relationships as you can squeeze out of your computer. At the same time. As fast as you can do it, yeah. You know, I knew a woman who, uh, you know, uh, used social media to, to, find, uh, to find husbands. And it was very efficient. And yeah. she found seven husbands that way. That's, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have to be a joke. I mean, you know, I mean, you could have, I'm, I've known people that, if, you know, they've got a Tinder date set for a six o'clock dinner. By eight o'clock, they figured out that it hasn't worked and they've got another Tinder date for, you know, for cocktails at 10 o'clock at night, you know, and it's, it's so what that does. What do you say at eight o'clock? We're done here. Yeah, we're, I think we've exhausted this. Um, but what that does is it works in favor of shorter term, more revolving relationships where people don't invest as much of themselves into it the way that you, know, you used to have to do. That's it. profound. And you know, used to be dependency from, you know, till death do we part, right. where your psyches were integrated completely, where you understood and the other person understood. Um, and you couldn't live without the other. I mean, you see that still today with some people. And you really invested a lot of yourself into the relationship. Now you don't have to invest anything, really. I mean, you have to, you know, you have to hit a What's button on the computer. When you don't invest in a relationship. Well, you you got a higher divorce rate. You got shorter term, shorter term relationships. Maybe maybe fewer kids. Maybe kids that are that are uh, then the result of a divorce or a, or a you know blown relationship. And then the impact is, you know, what's that going to be like? I mean, you know, what's it like to be raising a bunch of you know fatherless families in uh, you know in in, uh, in America? You got to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Just one question strikes me. Do are you writing anti live together? Agreements used you mean, to be called anti-nuptials. You mean prenuptials or, yeah, uh, before living together? My firm doesn't want to do that, um, you know, and I don't really like doing post, uh, post-marital post uh, agreements. There, there's a specific statute that, has, that, that says that premarital agreements, if done right, if concluded by marriage, they're going to be enforceable. You know, there's not really anything else. There, there's no statute that covers living together stuff. The and Lee then, Marvin. And you know, concept, family court's you know? not going to hear anything that doesn't that doesn't actually oh, good. end, end That's in marriage. That's the law in the state. Yeah, but it's not the law in other states. Some, uh, you know, that the uh, reality of it is that in Hawaii, family court limits it to just marriage or paternity. Yeah. If you have kids, but they won't. They won't come. I mean, imagine what the caseload would be if every time a couple that had just moved in together and moved back out wound up coming in and having a judge decide, you know, who happens. got to keep the dog and who, oh, it can happen. I mean, the civil courts will do that, yeah. but not family court. So you've got, you've got social media totally changing the nature of, of relationships. Um, and it's now estimated that you know, It's not only meeting the people, you know, it's not only meeting, making for dinner, it's all that. It's the way the relationship itself is conducted. The amount of contact you have with your other half during sure. the day. It's, it's different than a telephone call, it really is. It's different than having time together. It's, it's that immediate fly, you know, immediate, what do you want to call it? Immediate engagement and then bang, done. It's, it's, it's done by, by texting. And it it's can a be texting done. relationship. And on either, on either end, it becomes more superficial. Because when you had to, you know, when we were guys and we had to get a corsage and a date for the prom and call her up and meet her parents and, you know, uh, you know, that, you know, it took some, you know, it took a little bit of macho alpha male behavior to go do that. Now, as we all know, men's testosterone levels are dropping anyway. Uh, everybody's a metrosexual now instead of an alpha male. And, you know, and, you, and, you know the, way you, the way you now do a, a hookup with a gal, not that I've hooked up with anybody this way lately, but, you know, the kids, you know, hey, what's up? Me and, me and the guys are going to be at Joe's bar, you know, at 7 o'clock. Why don't you and your girlfriends come on down? Okay, is that, is that an invitation on a date, or is that, you know, what the hell is that? And then at the other end, it's ghosting. You know, you just, ghosting? ghosting is when you used to text everybody every day and tell them how much you loved them, and then you suddenly stop communicating with them all or blocking them from your, uh, from your, from your device. There's a message there. <laughs> yes. But, I mean, what kind of way is that to behave? I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it certainly violates all, all rules of civility that we used to know. We've talked about this before, but, you know, the Western civilization, in fact, global civilization is based on the family unit. And at least uh, my perception up till now, the stronger the family unit has been in a given society, 
the stronger the society. That's absolutely Our correct. The unit is declining, so you know that's uh, very very troublesome. That's absolutely correct. They say that 35% of all new relationships start up via the internet nowadays, and uh, and at least. Um, 20% of the of divorces are now attributed to Facebook. So you can, on the front end, you can meet them that way, and then all of a sudden, you know, something comes out of your Facebook page that you know makes somebody jealous, and the next thing you know, you're breaking up with them. So wow. you're you're start you're starting that way, and you're ending them that way, and it's all it's all social media. But you better be careful what you do on your Facebook page, <clears throat> because what your Facebook what's on your Facebook page gets you in real trouble. Real trouble. Yeah. yeah. So let's move on to, uh, to the significant changes in sexuality. Uh, pornography being one of the biggies. This is, this is totally amazing. 25% of all total internet search engines are porn related now. 8 to 10% of all emails porn related. 12% of all web websites porn related. Porn, when you think about porn, what porn does, and I'm sure you're not familiar with this, but you I just, don't know anything you'll have to take my word for it. Yeah. Neither of us know anything about it. <laughs> But he's still an expert anyway. <laughs> it alters. It alters. It can. It can alter men's expect what I call sex expectations of their partners, because you're sitting, bring it from the outside. You know, you've to got home. you've got a 45 year old wife, and instead you're watching a 20 year old you know pumped up, siliconed up you know stiletto heels young girl doing all kinds of unnatural acts that you haven't seen your wife try in quite some time, if ever. And all of a sudden you start saying, well, this is the way sex ought to be. You know, that's the guy's sex expectations, so to speak, are, are, are they're, they're lowered, uh, or maybe they're raised in a lower sort of fashion. But, you know, now you have men treating women more as objects, which is, Objectification. They're, they're, they're not happy about it. Yeah. Think of what happens when a guy takes a Viagra. They haven't got, you know, they're trying to have Viagra for women nowadays, but they haven't quite got it there. So a guy takes a, takes a Viagra, it has an immediate erection, he wants to immediately use that erection. Meanwhile, women who have always much preferred foreplay to, actual, to the actual sex act itself, and you know, statistics show women are looking for 15 to 20 minutes of foreplay before they, before they think sex they is much fun it. at all. And the guy's going, hey, I'm ready, let's go. And, you know, and so now women are even more pissed off, as if they didn't have enough to be pissed off at us for to begin with. The ultimate insult. Yeah. So it's, it's really kind of crazy. There's, there's, there's uh, countries like Japan where, there's, where sex is, you know, the, the sexuality, as to, men and women just are going totally separate directions in Japan. Uh, that's why you see so many of these young Japanese girls coming over here to our universities, you know, looking for a different what do you life. Mean separate directions. Well, they don't. They men and women are having little or nothing to do with each other in Japan anymore. That wow, would be that, that could be a, the, that the, could be a whole other curve, that could be a whole other show. Having children more whatnot. more closer to home. There's also statistics that are showing that millennials. You would think that all these Tinder and hookup things like that would be more sex. Actually, their their sexuality peaked in the, in the 1970s, sexually, you know, when, when we were all young hippies and it was lo peace, love, and, and sex. Um, the, uh, the reality has, is, uh, is now that millennials seem to be having far less sex and far fewer real mm. relationships. Oh, for the good old days. Yeah. But, you know, question of why. Why, is, why did it happen in Japan and why is it happening with millennials? This is it's troublesome because it's not you know, organic, it's not natural. Well. But it kind of, in, when you think about what, what the situation is for millennials right now, um, you know, a lot of them are broke after the recession. We took, we boomers took all the money. They've watched the recession happen. They're, you know, they've gotten real negative views of a lot of that. Some of them are living in their parents' basement. You ever tried to seduce a girl in your parents' basement? Um, you know, it's just, uh, there's, there's, there's we functional. We didn't have a basement. <laughs> there's functional things that are, that are happening with, with um, you know, that it makes it very difficult for millennials. And even though they've got this constant exposure to more and more and more, the reality of it is they're having fewer relationships. They're getting married much later. They're, 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 they're almost relationship resistant. They're, they're fine with this sort of group hang together kind of thing. Yeah. It's always skin deep, though. Skin going deep. back to social media. Skin yeah. deep. It's, yeah, not, yeah. You know, it's not like, okay, I'm going to commit to you. We're going to raise a family. We're going to, you know, all those hallmarks. We're going to get jobs. We're going to have a, you know, we're going to have a, a real relationship. We're going to have 2.2 children. We're going to buy a house. I mean, the millennials don't even buy cars anymore. You know, they, they ride share, they, they, rent, they rent rather than own. They, you know, I mean, it's a, everything's a transitory deal for the millennials. It's like skipping a stone on the surface of a lake. It's, it never actually goes under the water. Let's take a short break. I'm, I'm getting you know, slightly troubled by this conversation. <laughs> I, need, I need one minute break. Okay. That's Brad Coates. He's in family law, but he's also in family philosophy. It's really important to hear from him. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. 
We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off, and so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Okay, we're back with Brad Coates. Uh, you want to talk some more about the sex thing? Sex is always good. Make, you know, for big viewership if you talk more about sex. Sex is always fun to talk about, but we probably got to move on because I'm not Let's sure how much, uh, how much time you're going to give me. The third mega trend, living together, cohabitation instead of, instead of getting married and, and building a house or buying a house together now, everybody seems to want to live solo. And uh, I've got the statistics right here. Uh, only about 5 to 10% of all marriages in the 1960s were preceded by cohabitation, where you tried a, a trial living together situation. Then, you, then it was still assumed that you were going to get married. Now it's 55 to 60% by the 1990s, and the marriage rates dropped by 40% since 1970. So married couples are now less than half, 48% of all. I mean, it used to be that, you know, I mean, this is exact. In 1972, 75% of all U.S. adults are married. By the year 2000, only 56%. 2010 census, but cohabitation 48%. is up. Everybody, so, everybody so, wants to just live together instead of getting married. And for a longer period of time. And, I, and what I hear from all of that, let me ask you, what I hear from all of that is that some people decide to cohabit like permanently yeah. for their lives, you know, into old age. That's correct. Never a marriage. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, you, for one thing, it used to be that in order to get government benefits, corporate benefits, health insurance, you know, that kind of thing, you, you, know, you had to have an actual marital relationship in order to have your spouse qualify for your health plan. Now, you can have your significant flight benefits. You know, I, if, if you were, it used to be that if a flight attendant could only bring her husband along, now she can bring her boyfriend or her girlfriend or whoever. I mean, all this, all this expanded social... Uh, you know, social leniency, as it is, such as it is, yeah. is allowing everybody to have all the benefits they used to have with marriage without actually having to get married. Yeah, and so, try to take those benefits away from this uh, extended definition, you'll never be able to do it. So what we have is really non-reversible. It's going to continue. That's correct. That's correct. I mean, basically, now that everything's available to significant others, unmarried couples living together is up tenfold since, since 1960. Unbelievable. But cohabiting couples have twice the breakup rate of married couples, and 40% of people who cohabit have, have brought kids into the relationship, and they're going to then have to deal with, like I say, the paternity calendar of, deal, of you know, deciding the paternity custody. of these kids. Yeah, you may not have to decide property settlements, but you've still got to decide that. Turns what is out, it? Turns Getting out, married encourages people to have kids. That's still a reality. Well, yeah, that whole approach is, you know, is it encourages stability. And there, you could do a whole other show on the fact that society is almost segmenting down. The people that are staying married right now are college graduates, um, finding one another, you know, the lawyers marrying other lawyers, doctors marrying other doctors. Was that right? That was and, you know, it used to be that a lawyer might marry a legal secretary because, again, the proximity. She was, she was there. She was attractive. You know, it didn't really matter whether she had the same advanced education or earning capacity that you do. But now you want to share the profession. But in now you, you, you know you want to marry somebody that says equal earnings with you, so you can live in Kahal and you know between the two of you. <laughs> so it it really and now, now those people are available. They've got websites that you can go on just for people whose net worth is over a million dollars, and the professionals are able to find each other. And they, you know a lot of these oh, kids, wow. a lot of these kids coming out of college are just dating other Ivy League college graduates instead of you know, you know surfers. It, and it, it dawns on me actually, Brad, that this may be a factor in the disparity of, of wealth Oh, and totally. Income. I mean, it's, it's a, it, it totally broadens the chasm between the haves and the have not in society. Yeah, yeah. The people that get divorced, uh, you know, are, are oftentimes people that have high school education or less. They still get, they still get married. They, they get, then get divorced at a much higher rate than the college and, and, and graduate people do. And so you've got, then you've got kids, you're trying to, you know, you're 18 years old, you're trying to support a kid that's now, you know, you're, you know, you, that, uh, that's the result of your, you well, know, it goes down the other, the next generation because if you have two 
you know, high earners living together, they're more likely to be able to send their kid to college totally. than to low earners. So it really together. is segmenting society. So it goes one generation after another, and it perpetuates and expands this whole notion of the diversity of income. Ooh. Disparity Ooh. of income. Disparity. Yeah. Because like-minded people can find one another, or again, all yeah. on the internet. So that's and it turns out, turns out that people like living separately. A lot of people like living separately. They, you know, if you go back, I'm sure you spent a lot of time in the villas in, uh, in France and the kings and the queens. You know, the queen, queen's suite was over here, the king's suite was over here. I mean, yeah. you know, people didn't, yeah. wealthy people always kind of yeah. live sort of separately. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they were starting to design houses that way before the recession hit. Now they've had to come throttle back on that. But people like having their own space. And the boomers in particular, once they get divorced, a lot of times they're not inclined to get remarried again. Because, you know, I mean, you're 60 years old, why, you know, why so bother? So they live alone. So they, There's a certain risk to Living that, alone you know? or living apart together, where each, uh, where each party has they their own house, and other. then they go back and forth. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, the, 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 the rule, the black letter rule is, uh, if, you're, if you're elderly, living alone is dangerous, because there's nobody there to watch you, take care of you, drive you to the hospital, Correct. whatever it is. And, something bad happens to you health-wise or anything, uh, you don't have any safety net. So uh, I, guess, I guess part of this is you don't need a safety net so much as you did before. All right. I, I think you may be onto something. Yeah. That's the reason why it's your show. Um, <laughs> the, but that, you know, marriage in general used to be the big safety net. You know, you ate better, you, you, know, you, you know, you weren't out, you know, bouncing around in bars all the time. Your wife or your husband was feeding you the right food. If you collapsed on the floor, somebody was there to take you to the, to the emergency room. I mean, there, you, you had two earners could combine to buy a house. With, you know, I mean, the whole idea behind, just like you were saying before, the whole idea behind society as, a, as, the, as the, the, the mainstay of society was, was that married couples were, were good for society. Yeah. Had all kinds of benefits for, for a, a, a decent civilization. Yeah, small now, digression. Now, now we've just totally decided, well, we don't care about so that anymore. So how does that affect the larger you know, community? And I know it's speculative, but how does that, if I give you a country of everybody married, you know, the picket fence and all that, um, out of the 50s, uh, you know, leave it to Beaver. Right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> or now, where everybody's on, on his or her own, and even when they get a, they get a senior, this. And more, some of them are his or her own, relying on technology, relying on, you know, I don't know, community systems rather than family systems. What happens when I give you a country of 350 million people that are moving in that direction? Um, I think, I well, think, I, I, I think what, what happens, just a wild thought, is that instead of having the community of marriage or a tight family group, multi-generational, multi-generational family, I, I, I would give you instead a nation of communities on the internet who have like, like interests, who have like causes. Uh, and those, those, are, those are being divided these days. I mean, the country is being you know, cut Segmenting. up into all these communities that are sort of ticked off at each other. Somehow. Well, and people that grow, kids that grow up on the internet have a much more global view. I mean, they've got, I've got friends. One of my, my old law partners, his, his son just married a, a gal that he met from the Philippines, and they met in a game, they were gamers, and they were in a, one of these game rooms, and they, they'd never, you know, they, they met by playing video games. From, and, and you meet somebody from Ethiopia. From, so, so realistically, you're, instead of having a culture where it's, it's the focus is on your nation, it's more, you know, much more natural to these people to think globally and internationally. Well, that so, may be good. That may be that very good. That may be good. But it's also, I mean, you know, look at, look at our esteemed President Trump. You know, we, we want America to be the way America used to be, where you're an American, God damn it. And otherwise, we're sending you to, uh, we're sending you to Mars or to, uh, to back to where you came from. He's going backward a mile a minute. Just yeah. one thing I read yesterday was that he's trying to, uh, your attorney general, not mine, uh, <laughs> is trying to, re re you know, return to the death penalty. So, I mean, we're nice. moving back to the 12th century in rapid, rapid fashion. Well, there's, there's major, major changes. I mean, there's a question of whether or not, you know, sort of Western civilization as we knew it, you know, uh, is, is, uh, you know is, is in danger of changing radically, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's not a real problem. You know, one of the places where the unmarried is, and, and raising kids is, is one of the highest is in the Nordic countries, Sweden and, and, and uh, Norway and stuff, Iceland. They, you know, they've got... Getting married is almost an afterthought. They, they, they're raising of, uh, families as a single parent is very natural up there. And if you've got a small, cohesive society, a lot of those you know, socialist kind of policies can sort of apply. It's going to be trickier to see what happens when you do it with a nation, like you say, of 350 million. Yeah. But people's focus is definitely 
Way, way different than it used to be when it was everybody came back from World War II and, you know, and, you know, we were all Americans. Yeah. It's not only changing here, it's changing everywhere. Tra changing everywhere. So you've got a lot of these gray divorces going on. Let me just be, I never know how much time I'm going to get, get with you. So let me just read down my list of, my key list of marriage killer factors again. The internet, more options for more partners, so there's no need to settle on any one. And for boomers who have divorced once, no need to resettle or have a, or have a remarriage. Sex in the old days, if you, if you wanted to have sex, you had to get, had to get married to, to do it, you know. Now sex is readily available without marriage. Religion, we didn't talk about that, but I'm sure you, you could. Marriage is essentially a religious institution, but now religion's on the decline. Expanded, expanded benefits, government and corporate benefits, previously available to only married folks, are now available to significant others or life partners as well. Marriage is being postponed, a delay in the age of the first marriages, approximately 29 for men and 27 for women. As you, you, know, you may recall, when, you know, we got married when we were out of college. You got out of college at 23, you married a 21-year-old girl. And, you know, we, recession, cash crap millennials can't afford courtship, marriage, homes, kids, paternity, having kids out of wedlock was once a pariah. I mean, you know, one in 10 births was out of wedlock back in the 70s. Now, you know, now it's 40 to 50% of all live, live births. Many places, of, it's of, common, a common place. What I call the she economy, Rapid rise in education and career and monetary advancement for women. Now it makes them far less dependent upon ma marriage or upon men. I mean, like you were talking about the Donna Reed days where the you know, husband went to work and the wife had to just wait till he came home with a paycheck. Now she's got a bigger paycheck than he does. And more, <laughs> and more women have got more advanced degrees than men do nowadays. And then nine is living arrangements, cohabitation, and living solo were frowned upon in the past. Now it's totally acceptable. So whether that's a great thing to expand society's consciousness or whether it's going to prove to be problematic, well, you know, who knows? But uh, if, if, like I say, there's almost no way to predict because it has so many variables attached to it. Yeah. I want to give you one more, you know, for future reference. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the power to reject. You don't have to go through a divorce. You don't have to go see a lawyer. Yeah. If you're not married, you don't have to get unmarried. <laughs> you can just walk away. It makes it much easier just cut and run. And people change over their lifetimes. Your spouse may be, you know, your other, uh, may, be real, may turn into a person that you don't like anymore. You may decide that uh, you really made a mistake there somewhere and you, you want to, you know, find your own future. And she may want to find her own future. Well, if you're not married and living in one of these, you know, arrangements, you know, you can just walk away one day. Right, right. And that, that makes it all different. Um, in some ways, good suppose, because you can get away from a bad thing. In some ways, you can make a mistake on leaving, too. <laughs> well, it's, uh, again, I, you know, I tie it all into, into marriage and divorce. Uh, there, there's all kinds of evidence that shows that, that sex, for one thing, is better in second marriages than it is in first marriages. But it's also true that um, once you get accustomed to just cutting and running, you know, and, you know, okay, I, I get to leave whenever I want, you know, the divorce rate for a first marriage is about 45%. Divorce rate for second marriage is about 65%. Interesting. Divorce rate for third marriage is about 85%. Really? You know, by then they've got the divorce lawyer's number programmed into their speed dial, and they're just, you know, we're just ready to go. They get jaded. Yeah. So before we close, let's talk about your book. How about a picture of the book? How about that book? Okay, what about that book? What a great book. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is it? It's the complete how-to handbook and survivor's guide to the legal, emotional, economic, and social issues of marriage. Called Divorce with Decency, written by that brilliant author, Brad Coates. Okay, well, on our next show, we're actually going to put that to music also. <laughs> and maybe some dancing. Thank you very much, Brad. Great okay. to have you here. Great to Always have you. Always great to see you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.